the opportunity to uh, create content and to distribute it is available to anybody. Anybody who wants to can actually bypass all the traditional channels and become a widely viewed content creator. I'm going to show you another example here. Again, this is not journalism, but this is somebody who made this video, sent it to 17 friends. It's very clever, and I should please watch the writing on the side as well as the picture in the middle. It's very clever. He made it himself, um, and now uh, that they had a million downloads in the first week. He now has his own Hollywood development deal as well as his own show on the web. Uh, so take a look at this. Again, not news, but an example of the fact that the content is now easily, cr easily created and easily distributed without the help of a traditional channel. So, so now on the journalistic side of things, you have the uh, equivalent of this, which is the blogosphere. And the blogosphere is, a, is, is millions and millions. There's, there's over 70 million blogs now being tracked by Technorati, which is a blog search engine. Millions of people who have chosen to express themselves individually uh, on the internet, linking to other material and to other people. Um, and a lot of them are dealing in uh, journalism. It's grassroots individual journalism. Some of them are affiliated with journalistic organizations. Uh, many of them are not. Um, but they are able to cover stories, to do news and analysis, again, bypassing the normal channels. Uh, so an example of this is a guy named Jeff Jarvis. He's a very well-known, he's a professor of journalism now in New York City. He's also a very well-known blogger on a blog called buzzmachine.com. Uh, and he's also covering the presidential election on YouTube. So Jeff Jarvis will not have the huge audience that NBC News will for the election, but He's another voice out there that's legitimate journalism, uh, even though it does not have the imprimatur of a so-called mainstream news organization. I'm sure you've read a lot about user-generated content or citizen-generated media. There are all kinds of acronyms, whether it's UGC or CGM. But it's not just that citizens are creating content. Increasingly, they are sharing it. How often do you actually get a news story from a friend or a classmate who sent it to you or, or something that you find maybe on a Google homepage or somewhere else as opposed to in the original um, journalistic uh, organization that created it. You're more likely to read a New York Times story, I would bet, online than you are to read it in the New York Times itself. And certainly that's increasingly going to be a trend, particularly uh, with young people. And uh, the, the tools that really um, kind of are separate you know, this generation from the previous one, the television and print, and I know we have people in the room who are thinking of going into broadcast and others into print. Well, I think those distinctions are going to blur. And my first piece of free advice, and remember, you get what you pay for. All the advice I'm going to give you is absolutely free. I promise you, you will absolutely get what you pay for in all the free advice I give you. But the, uh, the first piece of advice is those distinctions are going to blur. So those of you who are going into broadcast had better understand what's important about print and what makes print journalism valuable and vice versa. Certainly people who are going into print are increasingly going to be under pressure as they try to become, you know, full-fledged modern uh, journalists in the 21st century to understand the tools of broadcast. But good journalists are going to become more important than ever, in my view, because in all this cacophony and chaos with all of these different voices, and when you're competing not just with Numa Numa, but with people who are practicing what purports to be journalism but actually isn't, uh, the, what makes a good journalist is going to become even more vital, not just people creating content, but also editing, people who are helping you sort your way through this complicated world. So one of the things I used to say at CBS is, you know, it's our job to make the important news interesting and the interesting news important. And one of the things to remember is what you leave out is just as important as what you put in. The metaphor I like for this is sculpture. If you look at, if you ever have the the, the, the pleasure to go to Rome and go to the Borghese Gallery, you'll see these sculptures by Bernini that will blow you out of the museum. In fact, warn whoever you're with, I'm about to be blown out of the museum, wait for me outside. They are so unbelievable. And these are sculpted out of chunks of marble. And what this brilliant genius of the Renaissance did was remove, if you think about it, what's he done? He's removed all the marble around this and left this extraordinary representation there. So in a way, when you put a story together, yes, you are building out of blocks, so it's not a perfect analogy to sculpture,
but you're leaving, you're deciding what to leave out, and that's where the accuracy and the fairness come in. What you don't want to do is tell a story that's compelling, but inaccurate or unfair for the sake of having the story be good. And that is an incredibly common mistake. I would argue that a lot of the things that pass for bias in, in news are actually a result of reporters trying to tell a compelling story at the expense of accuracy and fairness rather than trying to sell you a point of view. We sort of train for sameness but reward distinctiveness. So what happens first is your teachers are going to show you best practices and tell you certain things, just the way I'm doing now. I'm not even one of your teachers. I'm from outside and I'm doing it. But people are going to tell you certain ways of doing things that are kind of become the standard practice in journalism, and they're going to try to convince you that this is a standard worth following. And, it, and the first thing you need to do is kind of be comfortable doing those things, kind of fitting in. Um, over time, however, you're going to want to stand out. You know, between now and the age of 30, you're going to be turning yourself from a black and white cereal box, kind of a, you know, a, another bright, motivated young person entering the field into a brand. You will create something distinctive about you based on your skills uh, and your passions. So I guess the, so the next part here um, I want to think about is how do you actually do original work while fitting into you know, a, a journalistic uh, organization? And as, I, as I've hinted here, I think the beginning is getting the basics down. I think if you, you, know, if you don't have the basics, you will not be a successful journalist, period developing your own sources, your own sources, not just the usual suspects. Who else could I call that might know something about this that isn't going to be the obvious? You know, you go beyond the PR person, you go beyond, you know, the cop who's been assigned to talk about the crime. Go back behind the building and find the neighbor who might have seen something, who might have told you that that couple's been fighting for weeks and nobody's surprised. And the neighbor says he was such a nice guy, baloney, everybody else hated him. Don't be afraid if you're going into print to learn how to use Final Cut Pro, which is on all these machines here, uh, or, or to use a camera. You don't have to become a cinematographer and go and make a Hollywood movie, but you need to know how to do this because increasingly your market value, the cereal box, will become more valuable as you know how to use uh, other techniques. And you're going to be under pressure as the cost of news gathering are continually forced down by the economics of the business, which are not the greatest. You're going to be under pressure to do it all. And the most exciting work you can do, work you can do would be to say, OK, I'm going to go out. I'm going to find a great story. And I'm going to be skillful enough to tell it in all these ways. I'm going to be able to tell that story as a print story, as a text story. For people who like to consume it in a linear text fashion. I'm going to be able to tell that story as a video story. For people who prefer that and as an integrated combination, which is still just starting to emerge now on the web, I'm going to be able to do that too. So I think there's a, uh, so that integrated storytelling is one new important ingredient in originality, and the other is understanding how to use feedback and the community. So before I wrap up, I want to just give you very briefly uh, a few ideas about that first job. I know I'm a little ahead of myself, but since I'm, you know, I don't know if I'll ever be invited back. Based on the looks on your faces, the answer is no. So I'm going to give you uh, just a, a few of my notions about finding that first job. So I have three criteria for what the first job ought to be. And they all have to apply. You can't pick this, not a, a menu. They all have to be there, okay? It's a prefix menu. You must order all these dishes, okay? So the first is that the job provides a credential. Because we still are in a world where you're competing, and in your world, is going to be much more mobile than ours. We both worked at one place for a long time. You're going to be going from place to place, so you do need to have a credential. So you want to work for a place, if you're not working for yourself, you want to work for a place that's recognized by others as doing worthwhile journalism. That, so, that, so that's thing one. Thing two, exposure to smart people doing the kind of work you want to do. Now, it may be that in your first job, you won't get to do the kind of work you want to do right away. There are entry-level jobs that may, not, that may not be as challenging and may not use you to your full ability, may not take advantage of everything you learned here at Stony Brook, but at least exposure to smart people doing the kind of work you want to do. And then out of that group, you, you learn by watching, and you also acquire mentors from that group. And the third one is the job has to have the potential for you to exceed its requirements. In other words, you have to, it has to be a job that allows you to rise above the demands of the job, to go beyond what's expected of you. You're going into a Darwinian competitive environment. It's a star system on both sides of the camera, in the case of broadcast, certainly in every newsroom I've ever been in, uh, on the print side too. 
Uh, so because it's a star system, you have to be able to rise above the demands of that first job. So if you're working on an assignment desk someplace and your main job is to watch the wires and answer the phone, great. You've got to do that perfectly. But you know what? Chances are the person next to you can do that well too. But when you come up with 10 great story ideas and the culture allows you to do that and welcomes that kind of initiative, even from the junior people, then believe me, when it's time to promote to the next level, uh, you will get the nod. So in terms of actually finding the job, and I know we're ahead of ourselves here, uh, first of all, put yourself on a schedule, just as if it were a diet. Now, nobody here needs to go on a diet except for me at the front of the room, but let's say you did. It's more effective to go on a diet if you give yourself an actual achievable goal. And the same is true in job hunting. If you say, I've got to get a job, I'm going to spend 20 hours a day looking for a job. You know how many hours a day you're going to spend? None. Because who, nobody could possibly spend 20 hours a day looking for a job. If you say, I'm going to spend three or four, a real number, and then, then you're much more likely to actually do it. The second thing is research, research, research. These same tools that we're talking about, digital media tools, allow you to learn so much about a company now before you ever go there. So when you go in for an interview with a potential employer, you need to know that they've just launched a new website. You, you, you wouldn't want to show up at Condé Nast today and not know that this is the first day that the new business magazine portfolio is out, or that they spent $40 million on it, or that Joanne Lippmann is the editor, or that David Carey is the producer, or how it's different from Business Week and all the other stuff that's out there. Because if you do, then all of a sudden you're back to the black and white cereal box. If you don't know those things, if you do know those things, it's wow. This young person from Stony Brook is really bright because she took the time or he took the time and understands that we are launching a business magazine when everybody said it couldn't be done and has taken the time to think about what's different about portfolio from all these other magazines that in fact are declining in circulation. Then you take a piece of paper, or you can do it on your computer screen of course, and you develop a list that has three or four categories your call, okay? And the categories are must have, we kind of like to have, don't care. And if you want to put a fourth category in you could say absolutely don't want. Okay, that's up to you. So, and with that, and, and on there, and no one else will give you this advice, okay? This is more of that free advice and you're getting what you pay for. Put on there anything you want, including the personal stuff. Some of you teachers will say, well, you have to be willing to go anywhere, you have to, you have to go to a small market. Everybody's got advice. You have to go to a small market, or you have to go to a small paper, or you got to start in a wire service, or you can't possibly start in New York. No, no. Here's the real advice. The real advice is, you guys are already adults. So what you do is you make choices, including the criteria that are important to you, and just be aware of the consequences. So if you're starting out on television, you say, well, you know what, I have to be in New York, chances are you're not going to be an anchor right away, the way you might be if you start out in Sioux Falls. That's an adult choice with adult consequences. But if it's incredibly important, let's say you have you know, aging parents and you want to stay in this area, that's legitimate, then, you, then, then being in New York is a must-have, and you just recognize that you have, like the sculptor, you've excluded some choices, you've included some others. So in the must-haves, it could be, I, I must work with a team, I know myself, I'm not a loner, or I'm not an entrepreneur, I've got to be in a place where, you know, somebody else sets the direction and then I follow, that, that, that's what I do best. Or, you know, I, want to, I love writing, I've got to be writing within three months. Doesn't matter, you get to decide, this is your most personal list you'll ever make. The must-haves, would like the haves, don't cares, and then if you, as I say, if you want, the absolutely nots. And then, and then, and then you, you take that list and you use that and you use the research you started doing on the different places you might want to work and you start making a set of concentric circles, okay? Very simple. And the circles are units of time. And in the first circle, we'll call it the first month, you just put in the jobs or the places that you really want to go to. The uh, only and you focus entirely on those, and you, leave, you ignore everything else. Um, we, and the beauty of that is, if any of them says yes, you're going to go. What you're avoiding is the trap of like, do I go to Nassau Community or not? I haven't heard from Stony Brook yet. You won't be in that trap because Nassau Community won't be in the first circle. Stony Brook will. So, you, so the first circle is just the places you really, really would like to work in the first month, six weeks again, you decide this. And then after that first month, they're all cooking along, let's say nothing has come to fruition, then in the second circle, you put in, it's a degree of compromise, the next five or ten, and you concentrate, you, you keep the first ones going, and you add out. So these, you're, what you're radiating out in a, series, in a very rational way, so you have a system. So you take your list of must-haves and kind of would like to haves, and you lay them against what you're learning about the companies, and you populate the circles, and you organize your search, and you spend X hours a day, it's an achievable number for you, and I promise you, this system will work. Uh, I've, I've, I've tried it on many other young people, and nobody's ever come back for their money back.